Guys, are you ready? Because I got a lot to talk about tonight and I don't have enough time because I wrote out all my notes and it came out like twice as long as it's supposed to. So we're just going to jump right in and we're going to do the best we can. Uh, um, I think some some uh, beautiful holy women uh, of the early church to, to, to take a look at and learn about tonight. Uh, we're going to we're going to start. Um, well, I have a little introduction, of course, and then I'm going to take a look at St. Barbara. Some of you may have a devotion to St. Barbara. Um, uh, we're going to take a look at, uh, one you probably don't know, and that's St. Catherine, the all wise St. Catherine of Alexandria, um, uh, the Empress Augusta, um, the, uh, uh, the Empress Alexandra, and of course, equal to the apostles, St. Helena the Great. Yes. So if we can get there, we'll see what happens. Okay. Cause that's a lot of stories to tell. And I like to tell stories, but there's too many details. So we're going to jump right in. Um, uh, women of faith, heroines of the early church. Uh, I love this, this topic guys, for, for two reasons. First, most importantly, um, the, the most important is that uh, they're just witnesses to faith, right? I mean, they're, they're in themselves uh, in, in themselves and in their lives point the way to Christ as St. John the Baptist, you know, we talk about St. John as the, well, the first martyr, right? He's the, the word martyr means witness, the one who points the way, yeah, he witnesses to Christ. So we learn in John chapter one, uh, uh, what, verse three, verse four, there, he was, he came to bear witness to Christ. And so J St. John is a witness. And, and as I'd like to remind people, a person who's, who's martyred must be a martyr before they're martyred. Otherwise, they're not going to be a martyr when it comes time to be martyred, right? You got to, you have to, <laughs> Michelle, I saw that look in your face. Yeah. No, yeah. You, you have to be a martyr before you're a martyr. Otherwise you won't be a martyr when it comes down to be a martyr. You got that right. Because to be a martyr doesn't mean to have your head cut off. It means to be a little word martyr literally means to be a witness. And if you ain't witnessing to Christ in your life, when it comes time to give the full witness ain't going to happen. So you better be a martyr before you're martyred. Otherwise you're not going to be a martyr when it comes time to be a martyr. Does it make sense? Yes. So these women were martyrs. Before they were burned alive and had their heads cut off and all sorts of terrible stuff happened to them. Yes. And the fullness of that martyrdom then came, the fullness of that witness came in the full giving of their life. So number one, for their courage, their beauty, their virtue, yeah, in themselves, in their lives, they are valuable to us as Christians because they point the way to Christ. Yeah. There's a second reason, um, maybe more practical and that they are uh, witnesses to a critical moment in the life of the church. I would say the most important moment when it comes time for apologetics today, uh, because they are on the playing field, what you call the playing field of apologetics, which between the church and those who, who, who want to undermine the church and her existence and her foundation, is it's in these years that we're looking at that they lived in which certain people today will call into question whether the church established by Christ remained faithful or not. Yeah. And so they are witnesses to the life of this critical moment in which we can say, here's what the church looked like. Here's who, 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 who were part of our family. Yeah. Uh, and in coming to know them, we come to know what the early church believed, what she taught and how she lived fundamentally important in the area of, of, of apologetics is the church exploded out of Jerusalem and the seed which is planted by Christ, the mustard seed, yeah? The mustard seed grew up to be the greatest of trees. Yeah, I remember that parable in, 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 uh, in Matthew. I've got my Bible. Grab your Bible. You people, remember you have a Bible out tonight. You got to have a Bible. And also we got that resource for you that we mentioned and we're going to link it there. Did we already link it? Did we tell everybody where it's at, Andy? Yeah, we're good. So we did. good. So so we, you've got that there. Hopefully you've got your your print off. If you don't have your print off, don't worry about it. But you got to at least have your Bible out here. Good, Mara. See, so you got your Bible, your, your uh, hand out there. But the Bible, Matthew chapter thirteen. Show me your Bibles, guys. Come on, you can come to the ICC without a Bible. Forget about it. John, is that the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Is that the Bible? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's the Bible. Okay, here we go. Chapter, okay, Matthew chapter 13, 
verse ah uh, verse 31 here we go 1331 you got it right there okay you got me right there matthew chapter 13 verse 31 another parable he put before them saying you with me the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field it is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make their nest in its branches, yeah? And so this, and of course, a parable always points to something beyond itself, right? The church isn't a mustard seed, right? It's the church, right? But the church is planted by Christ, and now it grows up so that the whole world can come and take shelter within it, yeah? The kings and the queens of this world, which we're going to look at tonight, uh, come and take shelter within and underneath this tree. So when, and this is important from the apologetic standpoint, when, when we see the church in, in, the, in the first century, second century, third century, we see continuity, but we also see growth like in any business, right? Any business, like the Institute, well, we're a nonprofit, but you know, any nonprofit runs, if it runs well, it runs like, takes, makes use of good business practices, right? And if it doesn't, it, well, out the door, it's going to go, right? So it has to grow organizations grow businesses grow yeah well the church is an organism and, and it's going to grow so when we see it in the third and fourth and fifth and sixth century we're expecting to see that growth take place many people see that growth and they see it as somehow undermining or as as evidence of invention or of apostasy for god's sake no and jesus tells us this is what it's going to look like that it's going to grow and it, it, what was what looked like a, a mustard seed? You ever seen a mustard seed before? I mean, it's like little, like a little piece of pepper. But an oak tree, yeah. You see, they don't. They look different, don't they? An acorn and an oak tree don't look the same, yeah. But but they are organically an, an organism, you know, like an organism. They're the same, right? Everything's there in seed form. And this is, and so these women give witness to this beautiful time period in which this growth is taking place. I'll say more about that in a moment, but in particular today, we're going to be taking a look at that kind of later growth, that, that growth, which happened kind of as the tree grew up and then all of a sudden it leafs out, you know, in spring, for those of you that live in God forsaken places that the leaves haven't come out on the trees yet, I'm sorry, but here in California, all the trees have leafed out. Yes, most of them never lost their leaves. Thank you, Jesus. But some, but, but, but when they leaf out now, now they're like the myrtle trees and the, what else is out there that's putting leaves on it, right? The, some of the live oaks and things like that are, are, are leafed out now. They're beautiful. And it's that leafing out stage we're going to look at today in particular. And I'll speak more about that, as I said, in a moment. These women that we're going to look at today are witnesses to that time period in which the great father adrian fortescue described he described it this way when caesar ruled the world and thought he could stamp out the faith of christ when our fathers met before dawn and sang a hymn to christ as to a god yeah, quoting Pliny the younger as he wrote to trajan yeah in that time period in which caesar thought he could stamp out the christian faith of course persecution was nothing new to the early church, to the Christians of the Roman Empire. You know, John the Apostle himself was, was thrown in a cauldron of boiling oil, yeah, and uh, by the emperor Domitian. And when he didn't die, Domitian said, oh, maybe not a good idea. So let's, he exiled him to Patmos, St. Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, uh, in the year 117, is arrested by the emperor Trajan, uh, taken to Rome, and fed to the lions. St. Polycarp, one of my favorite uh, fathers of the church, right? 86 years old, Bishop of Smyrna in Asia Minor, um, was, was, was burned alive. And when, when his body wouldn't burn, they stuck a sword in his side, yeah? Um, uh, during the reign of Marcus Aurelius, uh, right around 150, 160, okay? So persecution was, was nothing new, like waves, that are, that, are, that are beating upon the side of a, of, a, of a boat. The waves of persecution sought to overturn the church itself, buffeting the church. And while the 
description of the uh, martyrdom of the early Christians is horrific. Well, those waves beating the side of the church is, is, uh, is truly tragic. Yet the response that took place was not so much a wave, but a tidal wave of conversion. As Tertullian famously said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And with that seed planted, growth happened. Uh, Tertullian goes on to, to speak of that kind of transition between that seed and the, and the tree in this way. This is what he says. If we wanted to play the part of an avowed enemy, should we be lacking in numbers or resources? We are but of yesterday, yet we have filled the places you frequent, cities, villages, markets, the camp itself, town councils, the palace, the senate, the forum. All we have left you is your pagan temples. Nearly all the citizens of the city are Christians. In between the waves of persecution that took place, there were moments of peace. And I say moments of conversion, yeah? Once the martyrdoms take place, then, then, then the conversions then take place. So the, the, the persecutions of the church go in waves, yeah, in those first few centuries. And during those times of peace, Eusebius, listen to what Eusebius says at the beginning of the third century. Okay, he says, though the grace, through the grace of God, the churches throughout the world enjoyed peace. And the word of salvation was leading every soul from every race of man to the devout worship of the God of the universe. So that now at Rome, many who were distinguished for wealth and family turned with all of their household and relatives unto their salvation. My brothers and sisters, the peace would not last long. In the year 249, the emperor Decius ascended the throne. He is described as an, as an able soldier. An able soldier whose virtue ranked him with the ancients. This is, this is something to remember about the emperors. Whenever they are the Roman emperors during this time period, whenever they are licentious, whenever they are uh, disorganized, then there's peace for the Christians. But when these guys are organized, uh, then look out. And Decius and another emperor we're going to speak about in a few moments had the same characteristics, whose virtues ranked him with the ancients. Four months into his reign, he issued his famous, or I should say infamous, edict against Christianity. As Dr. Carroll explains in his series on history, he says, every man, woman, and child in the Roman Empire must make public sacrifice before the idols of the pagan gods. Anyone refusing to do so would be killed. A general fear began to spread over the church. Remember, we're talking 250 and the years following, okay? Keep that in mind because we're about to advance about 50 years now to the year 300. A general fear spread over the church. The great St. Cyprian of Carthage went into hiding. Bishop Euctamon of Smyrna, of the Episcopal See of St. Polycarp, denied Christ and apostatized. Others, however, were captured and brought to trial. Among them, St. Peonius of Smyrna, whose words, you'll remember if you've, you've uh, studied St. Polycarp with me, his words echo his father in the faith. When encouraged to deny Christ, he said this, it is good to live, but that life for which we yearn is better. And all these things are good, but the reason we flee from them is not that we long for death or hate God's words, but because of the, surpa of the surpassing greatness of other things. St. Peonius was nailed to a cross and burned alive. St. Cyprian recalls what was common in the streets in those days. The sight, and I'm going to stop for a moment because I know there are families joined together. I meant to say this at the beginning. 
My brothers and sisters, I have to tell you that the, the situation was not a friendly one by any means. And the description of the martyrdom of some of these great men and women is horrific. Uh, so if you have young children and you're concerned about them hearing these stories, uh, I'll leave that up to you as parents. Okay. St. Cyprian recalls the sight of bodies hissing on red hot plates and blood bathing the streets, the city streets, enough to subdue the very flames of hell. Limbs beaten and torn as they were overcame the hooks that bent and tore them. The scourge often repeated with all of its rage could not conquer invincible faith. Although the hook springing forth from the stiffening ribs is put back again into the wound and with repeated strokes of the whip, the returning lash is drawn away with the rent portions of the flesh. Still, the Christians stand immovable. The stronger for their sufferings, resolving only this in his mind, that in the brutality of the executioners, Christ himself is suffering. Tertullian, Tertullian, who had died some 10 years earlier, became prophetic when he said to those who were persecuting the Christians, what will you do with the thousands of men and women, folks of both sexes, of all ages and of every class, who will offer themselves to you? How, how many stakes and swords will you need? You will never destroy our sect. Tertullian continues, mark this well. When you think you are striking us down, you are in ra reality only strengthening us. The public will become restive at the sight of so much courage. It will long to know its origin. And once a man has recognized the truth, he is ours. Among the holy women that were arrested and martyred for the faith uh, at this time was the great Saint Agatha, a young girl from Sicily in the area of Catania who was arrested she was whipped, she was tied to a tree and flogged, her breasts were cut off, and she was left in prison to die. In the year 284, the emperor Diocletian ascended the throne of Rome to deal one last blow to the Christian faith in what has come to be known as the 10th wave of the great storm. It was during his reign that St. Lucy, Santa Lucia of Syracuse, was beheaded. St. Agnes was burned alive. St. Athanasia, Athan Anastasia, I'm sorry, in, the, in our Byzantine tradition, called Anastasia, okay, the resurrection, that's what the word means, Anastasia, Anastasia, the name means resurrection, okay? Saint Anastasia had her tongue cut out of her mouth and finally her head was severed from her body. These women, of course, with Saint Agatha and others, we studied in our series on the holy women of the Roman canon. So I'm not covering them. If you're wondering why I'm going so fast through their stories because we already covered them in our series on the Holy Women of the Roman Canon. We're going to link that, um, Annie, right? We can link that in the email tomorrow. We're going to send it to all of you guys uh, as a, a, also um, in, our, in our resources on our website, okay? What is most interesting for me in preparation to be with you tonight is the societal shift that began to take place. You already hear it in the words earlier of Tertullian. Uh, and now from about 250 and really gaining steam around the turn of the century, around 300, um, whereas the, the earlier saints who had been martyred were many of them from what we might call the common folk, now that higher echelon of society, the ruling class begins to break apart. And, um, and, 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 and those of noble rank begin to embrace the cross of Christ. As with past persecutions, as I said, uh, the story is the same here. The more licentious and incompetent the emperor, 
the safer life was for the Christians. Diocletian, like Decius before him, is described as clear-headed, reflective, efficient, methodical, with a profound loyalty to the Roman imperial tradition. After seizing power, he, was, he, he had the wherewithal to do something which no one before him in the Roman ruling class had done. And that is that he decided to give away some of his power. Diocletian decided that the empire was too large and unwieldy for one man to control. He appointed a trusted friend as co-emperor, dividing the empire between east and west. Those of you that were in um, Dr. Papino's course will remember this. This is a, is a critical moment in history. Diocletian himself took the eastern part of the empire and appointed Maxinus to, uh, uh, to the west. For the first nearly 20 years of his reign, Diocletian focused on restoring the empire and stemming the tide of decay. And he was, for the most part, successful. For the first years of his reign, then, there was a certain peace uh, throughout the empire for the Christian community. Eusebius even describes the, quote, vast congregations of men who flocked to the religion of Christ and the spacious churches that were daily being built in society. Sporadic persecution did, of course, continue through these later years of the third century. And one of those martyred at the time became uh, known as one of the greatest of the holy women of the early church. And she is the first one we'll focus on, and that is St. Barbara. I have given you in your handout tonight, uh, for those that have it, if not, you can just listen, uh, a, an excerpt of the story of her martyrdom. It is a little bit long, and that's why I wanted to have it in front of you so that you can read it with me. This is uh, an account that goes uh, back quite some time. And so you're holding in your hands one of those gems of the early church, the true account of what took place. And so let's go ahead and, uh, and, and start this, uh, the reading of this account together, okay? And I don't know, oh yeah, there we go. We've got St. Barbara's um, uh, a picture there and notice the tower next to her, yeah? And always the martyrs carry in their hand the cross of Christ, showing that they gave their life for Christ. Okay, here we, here we have the, the account as it comes to us. During the reign of the impious Roman emperor Maximian, there lived in the east near Heliopolis a wealthy, renowned nobleman named Dioscorus, by ancestry of faith a Greek. He had a daughter named Barbara, his only child over whom he kept watch as the apple of his eye. Thinking baseborn, common folk and worthy to behold his daughter's fair countenance, Dioscorus kept Barbara in a lofty tower. While living in the tower, the maiden found consolation in looking out over the hills and valleys created by God, at the splendor of the heavens and the majesty of the earth. One day, while gazing into the sky, she began to reflect on the brilliance of the sun, the moon, and its course, and the luster of the stars. Suddenly, she asked the governesses and servants living with her, who made these? All things were made by the gods, the women replied. Which gods, asked the maiden. The servants answered, the gold, silver, and wooden gods that your father keeps in his palace and worships. These are the gods that made everything you see. Doubting the truth of this, Barbara said to herself, the gods my father reveres were made by the hands of men, those of gold and silver by smiths and those of stone by sculptors, the ones of wood by carvers. How can gods which have themselves been fashioned that can neither walk nor move their hands have created the luminous expanse of the sky and this beautiful earth. As she pondered on this, she gazed up into the sky by day and night, hoping to come to know the creator through his creation. Then one night after staring into the heavens for a long time, her soul filled with longing to know who created its wondrous beauty, expanse and splendor, the divine light of grace suddenly shone within her, opening the eyes of her mind to know the one invisible, unfathomable God who made heaven and earth in his wisdom 
She said to herself, he alone is God who was not formed by the hands of man, but is self-existent and made all things by his hand. He alone is God who stretched out the expanse of the heavens and sends down from on high the rays of the sun, the light of the moon, and the glow of the stars to illumine the whole world. Such me meditations kindled the fire of divine love in her heart, and the flame of desire for God burned fiercely in her soul by day and night. Before going away on a journey, Dioscorus gave orders for a splendid bathhouse to be built by the pool in his garden. Two windows were to be set in the south wall of the building. Dioscorus, her father, also left instructions with his daughter's attendants to permit her to come down from the tower. You'll notice, guys, that I have a lot of little ellipses in there because there's no way you can read the whole story. The, the intervening part tells a story of suitors coming to want to marry her and her saying, refusing them. Yeah. And so her father becomes concerned and says, OK, I'll let her out among the town to see if maybe he'll cultivate her desire for marriage. Free to come and go, Barbara made the acquaintances of several Christian maidens. From them, she learned of Jesus Christ. Barbara's heart was filled with delight as they spoke in a fire with love for Christ. She longed to be baptized. About that time, a priest came to Heliopolis uh, from Alexandria, distinguished as a merchant. Learning of this, Barbara sent for him. After teaching her the mysteries of the Holy Faith, the priest baptized her in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then departed for his own country. St. Barbara's heart burned even hotter with love for God after she was enlightened by baptism, and she exercised herself continually in prayer and fasting, laboring for her Lord to whom she betrothed herself, vowing to, pres to preserve her virginity undefiled. By that time, construction had begun on the bathhouse. One day, the Holy Virgin came down from the tower to examine it, and seeing that the structure had only two windows, Barbara insisted that a third window be added to represent the Holy Trinity. When the builders objected, fearing difficulties with their father, she insisted, I shall answer for you to my father. Only do as I say. So a third window was added to the bathhouse in accordance with her instructions. Presently, Dioscorus returned from his journey, and after inspecting everything in his house, he went to the newly completed bath. He became very angry with the builders and servants, demanding to know why they had disobeyed his orders and installed a third window. They protested. So Dioscorus called for Barbara at once and asked her why she had a third window installed in the bathhouse. Hear me, Father, said the saint, and try to understand my words. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the three hypostases of the God who is one in Trinity. They abide in an approachable light and illumine and give life to all creation. I had the workers install the three windows in the bathhouse so that one might represent the Father, another the Son, and the third the Holy Spirit. Now even the walls of our bath glorify the name of the Most Holy Trinity. Burning with rage, Dioscorus forgot the love of his child implanted in his heart by nature and drew his sword, intending to run it through her. Barbara took flight, and he pursued her with weapon in hand. Dioscorus found the cave where his, where his daughter had taken refuge, and he seized her and threw her to the ground, then beat and kicked her mercilessly. Taking hold of her hair, he dragged her home along a stony trail, and Barbara was locked in a very small dark hut. Seals were placed upon the windows and doors, and a watch was set, and the guards were ordered to afflict the saint with hunger and thirst. Thereupon, Dioscorus went to the governor, Martianus, and told him that his daughter had rejected the gods and now believed in the crucified one. He requested the governor to threaten Barbara with tortures so that she would return to her ancestral faith. Martianus agreed, and Dioscorus handed her over to him, declaring, I disown her, for she has renounced my gods. If she refuses to return to them and worship them with me, she will never again be my daughter, nor I her father. O mighty governor, torture her as you wish. The governor commanded that Barbara be stripped and stripped naked. Then the persecutors, the persecutor ordered that she be stretched out upon the ground and lashed with, le with leather straps until the earth was dyed red with her blood. After the flogging, the saints' wounds were, were rubbed with sackcloth and scraped with shards of, of, to increase her pain. But all these tortures, which buffeted the temple of the martyr's delicate young flesh more severely than any tempest, failed to shake her faith grounded on the rock, which is Christ the Lord, for whom she was prepared to endure gladly the, more, the most bitter of torments. Seizing Barbara with one hand and holding his bared sword with the other, Dioscorus, her father, led her to the place of execution. 
a mountain outside the city. As they walked, St. Barbara prayed to God saying, O eternal God, who has stretched out the heavens like a curtain and established the earth upon the waters, whose sun shineth upon the good and evil alike, who sendest rain down upon the just and the unjust, do thou now hearken unto me, thy servant, who prayeth unto thee. Hear me, O king, and bestow thy grace upon all who remember me in my sufferings. Do not permit illness to befall them unexpectedly, and let not death overtake them unawares. For thou knowest, O Lord, that we are but flesh and blood, the work of thy most pure hand. When they reached the appointed place, Christ's lamb Barbara bent her neck beneath the sword and was beheaded by her merciless father. As her, holy soul, as her holy soul departed unto her bridegroom Christ singing songs of joy, she was met by angels and lovingly welcomed by the master himself. Divine punishment, however, quickly overtook Dioscorus and the governor, governor Martianus. Thunder began to roar and lightning struck Dioscorus while he was descending the mountain. His body was entirely consumed, leaving behind not, not even a trace of ash. There lived in, Her in Heliopolis a pious man named Valentian, who removed the precious bodies of the holy martyr and returned them to the city, buried them with fitting honor, and built a church over them. Through the grace of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the prayers of the saint, numerous healings were worked through the relics unto God, who is one in Trinity, be glory forever. Amen. St. Barbara was martyred on December 4th in the year 290. And while the story of St. Barbara and the others martyred in those years between 250 and 300 were horrific, it is still true that, there in the, that the early years of Diocletian's reign saw some peace prevail, something of a respite for the Christian community, a respite before the storm. But that peace was not to last, and the storm did come. A certain man named Galerius, G-A-L-L-A-R-I-U-S, if you're taking notes, Galerius, who would become a, um, uh, the successor to Diocletian years later, was an avowed hater of the Christians. In the year 330, he gained the ear of Diocletian. Diocletian published his first decree against the Christians. Number one, all churches were to be demolished, all sacred books burned, and Christian officials were to be deprived of civil rights. Christians who were not officials were reduced throughout the empire to the status of slaves. At first, Diocletian did not allow for the shedding of Christian blood. But when two fires broke out in the imperial palace, the persecution took a more serious tone. The emperor published two more edicts calling for the imprisonment of all Christian clergy and the stamping out of all signs of Christianity throughout the empire. The persecution raged and Christian blood flowed. In Egypt, the persecution was so bad that the Coptic Christians to today do not date the year one to the birth of Christ. They date it to the beginning of the persecution of Ooh. Diocletian. Among the Christians living in Egypt uh, at the time was a certain young girl named Catherine. She was from an extremely wealthy family, and she received the best education possible. Alexandria, Egypt, in those days, was a center for Greek academia, uh, and she studied with the best philosophers of her time um, uh, and, and was known for her uh, keen intellect as well as her stunning beauty. And when marriage was proposed to her, she agreed but refused. She said to her parents, find me a man worthy of my formation, one who I can share wisdom with, or I will refuse 
to Mary. Unknown to Catherine at the time was that her mother was secretly a Christian. And hearing her daughter's response, she sent her daughter to speak with her spiritual father, who was a holy priest living in a cave just outside of the city of Alexandria. When Catherine met the elder and having discussed the issue with him, he famously replied that he did know one who surpassed her in every way, his beauty more radiant than the shining of the sun. His wisdom governs the whole of creation, and his riches are spread throughout the world. The priest gave young Catherine an icon of the Holy Virgin holding the child Jesus. And that night, she knelt before the icon, and Christ appeared to her. Catherine was soon baptized and committed herself to virginity and to her only true bridegroom. It was at that time that the emperor, uh, Maximian, the, the co-emperor with Diocletian, uh, found his way to the city of Alexandria for some of the pagan festivals that were going on there at the time. And continuing the persecution of the Christians, he had the Christian captives, or those that he had, he had captured, uh, taken to the games and offered as human sacrifice to the pagan gods. When Catherine heard what was taking place, she was moved by the spirit to approach the emperor himself and publicly declare herself to be a Christian. A description of what the Christians in Egypt were enduring at the time comes to us from the hands of the Christian historian Eusebius and is quoted um, in that series that, that some of you took with Dr. Papino in, uh, in volume one. I'll share with you the quotation from Eusebius about what the persecution was like during this time um, in which Catherine was arrested. He says, the outrages and sufferings which the martyrs in Egypt endured surpass all description. Their whole bodies being torn to pieces by shells instead of claws, even until, life, even until life was gone. And women were tied by one foot and were raised on high through the air, head downward by certain machines with their bodies and completely naked and without even covering. And they, and, they, and they furnished this most shameful and cruel and inhuman sight of all to all the onlookers. And others again died on being fastened to tree trunks and stumps for having brought together the very strongest of the branches by certain machines and stretching the legs of the martyrs one by one on each of these branches. They released the branches to be carried back to their natural position, planning a sudden separation of the limbs of those against whom they devised this. And all these things indeed were carried out not only for a few days or a short time, but for a long interval of entire years, sometimes more than 10 or 20 uh, 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 men were destroyed, sometimes not less than 30 or even 60 or 100 men in a single day together with a very young children and women were slain. When Catherine presented herself to the emperor, she boldly said, no, this oh, emperor, I, I've got this for you guys in your handout. That next section, you see that there? Okay. Know this, know this, oh, emperor, that you have been led astray by the demons. For the idols you serve are lifeless and subject to corruption. Great is the shame of the blind, foolish men who worship such vile things. Come to know the one true God who is ever existent, unoriginate, and immortal, and became man in the last times for our salvation. By him, kings reign and nations are ruled, and the whole world is sustained. He created and upholds all things by his word. For he is the almighty and all good God, who has no need of your sacrifices and takes no delight in the slaughter of innocent beasts, but commands only that we steadfastly keep his commandments. 
Hearing this, the emperor was greatly enraged. He said to her, tell us, maiden, who you are. The saint replied, my name is Catherine. Formerly, I was engaged in the study of rhetoric, philosophy, geometry, and the other sciences. But now I have abandoned these things as vain and useless and have betrothed myself to the master Christ, who said through the prophet, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. If you wish to dispel the darkness of gloom and gloom of the deception that has ensnared you, understand that your gods are nothing and come to know the true God. If you wish, I will prove to you the truth of my words, declared Catherine. Afraid to be overcome and put to shame by the maiden's bold and wise words, the emperor replied, it is not proper for the emperor to dispute with women. Instead, I will assemble learned philosophers to debate you. Thus, you will learn how groundless are your speculations and accept our beliefs. The emperor commanded the Holy Virgin be kept under close guard and immediately sent the following decree to assemble the followers, the, the philosophers of Alexandria. Fifty chosen rhetoricians, skilled in debate and mighty in declamation, assembled in Alexandria. The emperor instructed them to prepare themselves diligently and carefully to contend with a maiden and declared, if you prevail over her, I, I will bestow upon you rich gifts. But if you are vanquished, you will be rewarded only with a bitter death. But upon engaging in debate with Catherine, the chief of the philosophers was amazed and fell silent. The emperor saw that his champion had been vanquished and left speechless. He commanded the other rhetoricians to enter into, into dispute with the Holy Virgin, but they refused, saying, we are un, unable to withstand the truth. If the most learned of our number was overcome and silenced, what can we hope to accomplish? The emperor was moved to wrath and ordered that a great fire be prepared in the middle of the city to burn alive all the philosophers and orators. When they learned of the sentence pronounced on them, they fell at the saint's feet, beseeching her to pray for them to the one true God so that he might forgive them the sins they had committed in ignorance and deem them worthy of holy baptism and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The saint responded joyfully, truly you are blessed for you have abandoned the darkness have come to the, know the true light. Having forsaken an earthly emperor subject to corruption, you have, come to, you have come unto the king of heaven, who knows no corruption. Believe firmly that the fire with which the impious threaten you shall serve as your baptism, and be the latter leading you up to heaven. In that fire you will be cleansed of every defilement of flesh and spirit, and you will be presented pure and radiant as the stars before the Lord of glory, whose beloved friends you shall become. While saying this, St. Catherine traced over each philosopher and ordered the sign of Christ's sacred cross. Full of hope and gladness, they went joyfully to their martyrdom. As her fame began to spread, even the emperor's wife came secretly to Catherine and was secretly instructed by her in the ways of the Lord. Having bested the wisdom of the so-called wise of this world, Catherine endured the worst tortures. You'll see in the picture we're going to bring up, St. Catherine is oftentimes depicted with this, uh, first of all, her books that she studied, all of them on the ground, and placed upon the books the form of her torture. You'll see the wheels with the metal spikes in it, and upon the wheel... Uh, uh, the cross of Christ. She was tied to this wheel of wood with the metal spikes and rolled over and over and over on it. But when they untied her from the torture, she was unharmed. Seeing the miracle, the Empress Augusta, the wife of Maximian, and 200 soldiers who were watching what happened converted to Christ and were ordered by the emperor to be beheaded. Finally, the emperor tried to entice the Holy Virgin with the promise of marriage, but she refused with the words of her reply. The words of her reply come to us in a hymn that is written in her honor. I included it in your handout. She said to the emperor, my betrothed is the risen Christ, and I desire not the love of a corrupt man. 
You seek my body, the rotten seeks corruption, even as the incorrupt spirit seeks immortality. The physical covering must wither away. The true man takes care of his immortal soul. Do what you wish and torture me. Burn me in the fire. Turn me on the wheel. I cannot renounce my own soul, nor worship any but Christ as God. Remember, O emperor, soon you will die, and worms will erupt from your corpse. Worms will glorify you. Worms will eat you. A curse will accompany you, and a curse will meet you. For you dare wage war against Christ, who is mightier than death. You stand under the rock, and he will crush you. Catherine, the all-wise of Alexandria, was beheaded in the year 305, and her body remains incorrupt to this day. I have a nice little prayer here to St. Catherine, so why don't we pray this together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us praise the most auspicious bride of Christ, the divine Catherine, protectress of Sinai, our aid and our help. For she brilliantly silenced the eloquence of the impious by the sword of the spirit. And now crowned as a martyr, she asks great mercy for all. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. While the persecution of the Christians in Egypt raged, the rest of the empire endured nothing less. The bloodthirsty Diocletian had tasted first blood, and he became psychotic in his desire to stamp out Christianity. Among those closest to the emperor was a certain young man named George. George enlisted as a soldier in the Roman army and consequently rose quickly through the military ranks of the time. By his late 20s, he gained the title of tribune and became a member of the personal guard of Diocletian, the Roman emperor. It is believed that St. George was ordered to take part in the persecution of the Christians, but instead he confessed to being a Christian himself and criticized the imperial decision by openly denouncing Diocletian in front of the Roman Senate. An enraged Diocletian proceeded in ordering the torture of his apparent traitor. And St. George famously responded to Diocletian's threats with these words. Nothing in this inconstant life can weaken my resolve to serve God. George was stripped, tied to a wheel, and pierced with sharp pieces of metal, much like St. Catherine was. And like St. Catherine, St. George lived and was miraculously healed. In reply to the threats of the emperor, George replied, you will grow cold, you will grow tired of tormenting me sooner than I will grow tired of being tormented. Diocletian ordered George to be buried in lime and left him for dead for three days. But after three days, like the blessed Savior himself, George came out alive and unharmed. Enraged, Diocletian ordered George's feet to be strapped with iron sandals with red hot nails facing upwards and force marched him back to the prison. His body was scraped with metal rakes, peeling his skin from his bones, and he was given poison to drink, none of which harmed him. Finally, fearing what George had endured, Diocletian offered him to be co-administrator of the empire if he would only deny Christ and worship the pagan gods. George could not. Diocletian ordered George to be taken to a nearby pagan temple dedicated to the god Apollos so that he could offer public sacrifice to the pagan gods. But as soon as George entered the temple, an earthquake broke out and the idols fell from their pillars and smashed on the ground. And you say, Father Hezekiah, 
what are you doing talking about St. George? Because I'm supposed to be talking about holy women. And I do so because it is at this moment in the story that a beautiful woman's face does appear. It happened that standing nearby and watching what was taking place was one Alexandra. It just so happened that she was also the wife of an emperor. She was the wife of no one less than Diocletian himself. And she was overcome by what she witnessed. The story of St. George's martyrdom continues in this way. When the pagan idols broke into pieces at the presence of the saint, the people then rained blows upon George and cried out to the emperor to execute him. I also have this in your handout right there for you. Okay, grab your handout. The people then rained blows upon George and cried to the emperor to execute him. Yeah, do you guys have that there in front of you? Yeah, good, okay. The tremendous tumult that took place in the city was made known to the empress. Now, Alexandra had already confessed Christ in her heart and soul. She could no longer refrain from keeping her new faith a secret, and she desired to make an open avowal, whereupon she hastened to the temple of Apollo, seeking George, and unable to reach him for the press of the mob, she cried out, O God of George, help me, for you only are the true God. At length, the crowd calmed, and Diocletian ordered that George appear before him. The emperor, incensed, bellowed, This is a token of your gratitude, O evil head. In this manner, have you learned to sacrifice to the gods? The saint answered, no, O mindless emperor. I learned to disdain the gods who are unable to save themselves from, this, from extinction. As the holy George spoke, Alexandra arrived and fell before the martyr's feet. She then thanked the saint for, for ridiculing the idols and astonished at his wife's words and actions. The emperor, unable to compose himself, said to his wife, what has happened to you, Alexandra? that you follow this magician and, and renounce piety to the great gods. The empress answered, O oh, dull-witted, impious, and lawless emperor, you are blind, benighted, in error, and do not believe the truth. Neither can you recognize the Christ, that Christ is the true God. When the emperor heard his wife's rebuke and insult, he was at a loss how to proceed. However, from his rage or from his sorrow, he ordered that George and Alexandra be imprisoned together. Diocletian then wrote this decision. George, the Christian, who has despised my authority, insulted the gods and destroyed the idols, I command to be beheaded together with the Empress Alexandra. Thus, their sentence was officially decreed, but before the execution could take place, the Empress willingly gave her soul to God and breathed her last. Shortly after her repose, the repose of St. Alexandra, the soldiers then took the great martyr George, escorted him outside the city. He eager, eagerly went with them, hastening that he might soon enjoy the desired one. Arriving at the execution site, St. George prayed aloud. He then bowed his head under the sword and received the reward of his labors. It was the 23rd of April in the year 304. Truly, Truly, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, for it would be only a few years, less than a decade, before Constantine preparing for battle at the Milvian Bridge in the year 312 would see traced in the sky the words, in hoc signo vinces, in this you shall conquer. In this sign, you shall conquer. Seen in the sky, the form of the Holy Cross. Two years later, having issued his edict of toleration, Constantine summoned 46 bishops of the church to the city of Arles and declared the following. It is quite amazing when you think that this was, this was a pagan emperor only a few years before, much like Cyrus at the return of God's people from Babylon. He said this to the bishops gathered there. The incomprehensible kindness of our God by no means allows the state of a man to stray for too long a time in darkness, nor does it suffer the odious wills of some so to prevail 
as not to grant men a new opportunity for conversion to the truth by opening it up before them through its most glorious light, a path to salvation. Of this, indeed, I am assured by many examples, and I can illustrate the same truth from my own case. For at the first, there were in me things which appeared far removed from the truth, and I did not think that there was any heavenly power which could see into the secrets of my heart. What future ought these, ought, ought these things which I have mentioned to have brought upon me? Surely one overflowing with every evil. But Almighty God, who sits in the watchtower of heaven, has bestowed upon me that which I did not deserve. Truly, most holy bishops of the Savior Christ, at this time, I can neither describe nor number these gifts, which of his heavenly benevolence he has granted to me, his servant, the Emperor Constantine. Two years later, after the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, Constantine would issue his Edict of Toleration. And soon after, his mother, the Empress, Con uh, the Empress Helena, converted to Christ. She was 65 years old when she converted, and she would live for only 15 more years. But in that time, St. Helena set her face to Jerusalem. And there she rediscovered the location where Jesus had been crucified and had risen from the dead. Over that location, a temple to the god Aphrodite had been built so that the Christians could not honor the site. She ordered it leveled and the Holy Church of the Resurrection to be erected in its place. We have the next slide there. there there's the Church of the Anastasis, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in its current state. The church built by St. Constantine and St. Helena was much, much larger than the current church. She ordered also the church, which still stands to today, the church in Bethlehem, built over the cave of the birth of Christ. You can see it there. It dates from the time of St. Helena. She also ordered on the Mount of Olives, the church of the Holy Ascension, to be built commemorating the place where Jesus taught his apostles, the Our Father, and where he ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. Truly, truly the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that when it grows is the greatest of all trees under which kings and yes, queens will come to rest. I leave you, my brothers and sisters, with this. While the world would like us to believe that the church oppresses women, that Christ and Christianity do not respect the dignity of womanhood. History exposes their lie. From the moment of the resurrection, women have always been held, upheld by Christ and by his church. For one reason and one reason alone. Because they are the ones who have been the strongest witnesses standing against the greatest powers that this world can offer. It was at the hand of a woman that salvation came to mankind. And it seems that it has been the witness of women ever since that have sustained the church in our faith. May the holy women of the church pray to God for us. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. Wow, what a powerful set of stories you have shared with us tonight, Father Hezekiah. Thank you so Thank much. You. That was beautiful. Thank you. It was so beautiful. Father, are you ready for some questions? Yeah, but I forgot to show everybody these awesome icons. Look at St. Oh. Barbara. Ooh. Ooh, there you go. I went and grabbed them from inside the church just before the, the program began. And uh, also uh, St. Catherine of Alexandria. You see the all wise. Yeah. 
Oh, that's awesome. There she is. Yeah. That's beautiful. So cool. Well, actually, hold up St. Barbara again, because um, we have a question that came in about her father. Um, just wondering, why isn't she mentioned much in the church anymore? She has such an incredible story. Why wouldn't they, uh, why wouldn't it be shared? Um, yeah, unfortunately, I got to, this is a rather, this is, okay, well, um, I'll, I'll tell you why, because in the, in the, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there began to be a movement um, in Catholic academia that, that, that um, seeped into our seminaries, um, uh, the movement of rationalism, uh, which subjected all things to scientific testing, and that which could not be subject to scientific testing was declared to be unknowable, uh, maybe not real, made up. Yeah. So miracles are out the door. This was the time when we we're getting so-called Bibles that were stripped of all the miracles of Christ because they weren't trustworthy because they couldn't be scientifically tested uh, and so forth. Um, and it was right out of that school, that influence uh, in the post Vatican II period that the new calendar was put in place. And unfortunately, when the new calendar was assembled, many saints were removed that had what might be called miraculous occurrences claimed around their life and their death, things which were, you know, not, uh, this can't happen, right? Well, the story of St. Barbara is very miraculous. I'll tell you, there was part I cut out just for a time. She was fleeing from her dad. Um, and it said as she was running that the wheat, she was running through a wheat field and the wheat parted to let her go through. And then the, it was tall and closed back so that he couldn't see her. And then she approached that cave that 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 mountain and that cliff that the rock actually opened for her okay and you know i'm you know so if you if you don't believe miracles happen that's that, that's that's fine but but uh unfortunately many of the great saints were removed saint valentine um and other great saints that uh that have had a great place in the spirituality of god's people and saint barbara is one of the one of those great saints that uh that has captured the imagination love of many of the people, especially the people of the Middle East from, from my parish, um, have a great devotion to St. Barbara. We have a big feast for her every year. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so anyways, that's, that's kind of what happened. You can do more research on your own. Is that fair enough? Leave it at that. Father, fair can enough. I jump in real quick? Yeah, Peter, go ahead. St. Barbara is one of the 14 holy helpers. So even if we've lost sight of her in the West, we, there is a tradition of you know, her there's so many of these things oh, just because she's on the calendar not not on the calendar doesn't doesn't matter i mean that doesn't mean you can't venerate a saint who's not on the calendar there's a lot of saints that aren't on the calendar right there's a lot of saints that aren't on the calendar um and uh and 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 but you should come to know them and love them and be devoted to them and so she's certainly one of them yeah december december 4th mark it on your calendar and um and you can look up there's a beautiful tradition of making saint barbara wheat on her day it's called babara the grain of wheat that falls and 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 to the ground and dies bears much fruit yes so we make what is called the babara the the, the uh, saint barbara wheat and um and then we have all the ladies of the parish bring their bowls of of their of their wheat to the church and afterwards it's like a dessert you know and then they all compare which one made the better one and i have to eat all of them because and i have to declare that they're all equally good you know it's just part of the, being a pastor yeah equal to the apostles that's right equal to the apostles equal, yeah. equal to speaking <laughs> of why did you call saint helena equal to the apostles father another question that came in um yeah you know the, the there's a tradition there's there's many saints that are that are given this title equal to the apostles um it's not a title known very much in the west but uh, St. Constantine the Great, equal to the apostles, and St. Helena, his mother. Why? Because these are saints which were so evangelical, right? They just gave their whole life over to spreading the word of God. And so um, some people get, get, get upset. You know, they'll say, oh, Constantine was a sinner. Yeah. And so are you. Yeah. <laughs> All, and saints are saints because they were sinners before. You know, they were saved by Christ. And so, uh, so uh, Constantine is, is one of those great men of the church who many of the saints lived bad lives throughout much of their lives. Yeah. 
but the question is what they did for Christ and how they died. Yeah. And so we uh, seek to emulate their, the, the good parts of their life. So yeah, St. Constantine, St. Helena, equal to the apostles. I think All right, just a clarification question. Um, Father uh, Teresa Cotter asks, Catherine the All-Wise, she's the same as Catherine of Alexandria? Yeah. Same, same yeah. person? Yeah. Okay. All right, so that- well, quick... I don't know if there's a later St. Catherine of Alexandria that I, that, but, but this is the St. Catherine of Alexandria that I'm talking about, you know, persecuted during, during the time of Diocletian. Yeah. Yeah, incredible 300, 304, I think that was, 304, something yeah. like that. And I think Teresa on the-, on the and Teresa Cotter, by the way, when you're looking, you know, she's always hold, she's always got that wheel. Well, actually, she doesn't have that wheel in this in this icon, but in a lot of icons, she's standing next to the wheel. As many of the martyrs do, they'll oftentimes hold in their hands the evidence of their martyrdom, um, and or whatever the case may be in the depiction that is given them, so you know their story and you're reminded of what took place. Mm -hmm. Teresa on screen, I believe you had a question. Go ahead. Oh, Cargill's uh, back at it, huh? Cargill, be careful. I don't. I used up all my material. It's okay. It's actually a pretty simple question. Um, just wondering, what are some resources if somebody wanted to learn more about these early saints? Um, okay. Uh, well, the first resource is the best, of course. It's, you're going to write this down. It's called, ready? You got a pen? Institute of Catholic Culture.org. No, I'm kidding. No, but I, I will tell you, no, I'm kidding. There's a few resources that I just I point you to because I know you guys are on here, and that is the, the talks that we've had on um, um, the Apostolic Fathers. Okay, we're going to link that in your email. It wasn't really a talk on the Apostolic Fathers, it was a talk on the Apostolic Fathers and the Apostolic Mothers. All right, so we did, we did Ignatius of Antioch, we did St. Polycarp. And then, oh, we started with St. Mary Magdalene. And then we, because she's an apostolic mother, right? She's the apostle to the apostles. That's her title. If we get equal to the apostles, she's the apostle of the apostles. Look out for that one. All right. And then we did St. Mary of Egypt, okay? Who's not really, a, you know, she's, an, she's a mother of the church. She's not apostolic, but nevertheless, it's there. Okay. There's those. Um, uh, we also um, did our series on the holy women of the Roman canon. And we did this talk tonight. Then, in addition, I would recommend getting your hands on a book I've oftentimes recommended, and that is the writings of the early fathers put out by, um, by um, Penguin. We're going to link that in our, it's a little like $10 book you can't lose. And you read Ignatius of Antioch, the martyr of St. Polycarp, and these guys is fantastic. Okay. Um, and uh, and uh, I've got some other resources, but they're out of print. They cost you like $500 to get the book, and I, you know. But I incorporated them into my talk, so. Yeah, you can always look online and find um, like yeah, you, New Advent and places. New like Advent that that is have... a great resource. Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of the some of the stuff's a little stilted in its language. Uh, that's on New Advent, but still a great resource. Absolutely. Yeah, Robert, yeah. I saw you raise your hand. Go ahead. Uh, Father, um, my question for you is: uh, We always see in our icon of Saint George, we always see him with uh, uh, on a horse with a sword, uh, killing a dragon. Uh, mm. my understanding, that's a legend. Uh, why do we include legend in our icons? Okay, good. That's a, that's a good question. You know, there's, um, this hard distinction that we owe rationalists of the, you know, 2022 want to put, and that is it find a lot, a clear line between fact and fiction, right? A legend and, uh, whatever. But as a matter of fact, here's the way the early church kind of functioned and what the way society functioned in those days. And that is that, stories would be embellished not not to tell a lie but to tell the spiritual truth okay um and so um um many of these so-called legends are actually rooted in the piety of the people and their devotion to the person who they know to be of a certain character yeah um and so um so even in some of these stories yeah, well, that's a little far-fetched well, I really don't think it's far-fetched. I mean, I, I read the, the opening lines, by the way, of St. Polycarp. There's another talk we had at the Institute. Not St. Polycarp. Oh, St. Mary of Egypt. That's what it is. St. Zosimos' uh, uh, words. Maybe I'll look it up here while, I'm, while we're doing our little thing. And that is, he says, he says and if anybody doubts this um, miraculous story that happened in our age, may God have mercy on your soul. Do you doubt that Jesus walked across water? Do you doubt that Lazarus walked out of the tomb? Do you doubt that, 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 that a sinner like me stands at the altar on Sunday and gives you the body and blood of Jesus Christ? 
okay? We are, we are believers in something more than what we can scientifically test. And the whole of the created order bows before Christ. This is why he walks through locked doors. Because the material world is meant to be revelation. That's what its purpose is. And so when the Lord requires the material world to give way to its, its, its kind of natural form, if you will, it does so because it is at his will. That it, water allows you to swim in it because God wills it to be so. The ground you stand on is solid by the will of God. Now, in this moment, we never see, this is why I always tell people we become a Eucharistic people, a people of thanksgiving, because our entire life is sustained by God's love. The fact that you're taking a breath in right now is a gift, and it could stop at any moment. But God allows this gift because he loves us. So with every, every, every uh, uh, breath and every uh, blink of our eye, with every time we stand on the floor, our response should be, thank you, Jesus, until we are transformed into the Eucharistic person, right? The Thanksgiving person. That's what these women, these holy women are all about. Thank They're you, Eucharistic God. women. That's what they are. And all of us are invited to become like them, a Eucharistic people. Was Let's, a hand oh, sorry. Was there a hand? I got St. Barbara over here there, Annie. Oh, okay. Angela, do you have a question? Sorry. I do have a question. I couldn't help but notice as you're reading the story about Barbara, the third paragraph there, um, the gods my father of yours were made by the hands of men. I mean, that really echoed Psalm 115 to me. Is that, you know, something that they, when they were writing these, that they were very intentional about how they put that in there? Exactly. Just like the gospel writers. The gospel writers highlight aspects of the, of the life of Jesus and his teaching. Not that he didn't say these things, but they, they, they intentionally quote particular things or point out particular things that are going to highlight them for you. Yes. So the authors that's giving the account, certainly uh, placing those words upon her lips. I'm not going to say she didn't speak them. Yeah. Um, but, but you, you understand the point, right? Is, is to, to the, the whole life becomes revelatory. There was something related to that. Oh, St. St. Is it St. Catherine? Yeah, there was a paragraph in there too, that really kind of made that same point stand out to me. But it was St. Barbara I was thinking of. Barbara's at the, in the tower, right? And she sees the, 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 the beauty of God's creation and comes to faith in him. That's right from first Corinthians. Yeah, or no, no, Romans. Am I right? Romans chapter one. Hold on. We're going there, guys. Turn your Bibles open. Romans chapter one. There it is. See, I beat you all there. So one of these days, you got to get faster than me. Don't worry, Barbara. We're coming to you over there. And then we're going to finish up, Annie, I think, right? Yeah. Yep. Romans chapter one. Verse 18. 118, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of men who by their wickedness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Ever since the creation of the, of, of the world, his invisible nature, namely his eternal power and deity, has been clearly perceived in the things that have been made. There it is. Right. And so St. Barbara sees this and she comes to faith. Right. And notice she refuses to worship those things which her father worships, knowing that there must be a power ab above them. Yeah. And what St. Paul talks about in Romans chapter one is he says, look out for those that worship those things will be corrupted by them. Right. And who does he what does he say they're going to start to do in Romans chapter one? Well, men are going to exchange natural relations with women for relations with men, and you can go ahead and read the rest yourself, right? I mean, it's all there. It's all there. And you want to know how the slippery slope happens? Romans chapter one. Barbara, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm interested to find out the source that you used for this little um thing about saint barbara i'm very grateful that i finally found some kind of 
solid information about my patron saint because I've heard all kinds of little stories that they couldn't prove this or prove that. And it's oh, for God's sake, throw that stuff out, Barbara. Throw throw the television out. It's gone. <laughs> good, 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 good. You can find good traditional sources. They're going to give her the resources for her life. Uh, there's a wonderful resource online by an Orthodox uh, guy, uh, John Sandupolos. I'll let you write, <laughs> uh, write that name out. Don't worry, I think I can. We yeah. can give you this. Uh, John Sandupolos, uh, Mystagogy, I think his, his, his website is. He's got some of the old juicy stuff. And he pulls a lot from a series that is um, it's out of print. Hold on just a minute. It's out of print, but it picks up some of the old timey good stuff. Okay. And it was, it was collected among the Russians and, um, um, and uh, compiled by an, a convent in no less than a place in Colorado, Holy Apostles uh -huh. Convent in Colorado. It's a series of, uh, of, of books. Uh, this one is the life of the Virgin Mary, the Theotokos. So uh -huh. these are, these are Orthodox sources uh -huh. and, um, but they, they pull together all the old timey stuff and uh, not infected in any way by this modern rationalism business. They've got, uh, there's one book on the holy lives of the holy apostles that I used a lot in my series on the lives of the apostles after the resurrection. By the way, for those that are loving the season of the resurrection, we had an, well, I don't know if it was nice because I did it, but I had fun doing it. And that was the lives of the holy apostles after the resurrection. I don't know what the title was from Jerusalem or something. No, it wasn't from Jerusalem. I don't know what it was. We'll get link it for you. Um, and where, where each of the apostles went and what they did and what, how they were martyred and stuff. It's pretty cool. It was a really interesting uh, thing. Um, and uh, also during this time, the appearances of the resurrected Lord after the resurrection. I don't remember the title, but that was another series we did. A lot of fun. But this is a series of books. You can't get it. It's very expensive. Um, but if you ever pick it up at a used bookstore, that's what they all look like this same look. So you got to look at those things. Okay. Yeah. And there'll be the lies of the holy apostles. And then the, the lives of the holy women, something like that, or the early women uh, saints. And John Sandubulos has got a series, he's got them and he's written them down. So I stole it off his website because I couldn't, I didn't have a copy of the book, you know. Anyways. Nice. Yeah. Great way to end the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we have a beautiful hymn to the mother of God that we played in the countdown and in the closing show. So my family sing it together for uh, an angel cried out an angel cried out yeah an angel cried out yeah and then shine shine and all this stuff was to magnify the mother of god and the whole of the body of christ the new jerusalem and it's the same type of a hymn that is sung in the latin church regina chaley okay it's a special hymn to the mother of god to, to say thank you to all the gifts she's given to us okay and so we'll do that why don't we start with that one and we'll close with the regina chaley tonight does that sound good, family over there? I didn't prep you guys at all, but you got to sing and veto. Veto, we want to hear your voice, especially on Shine Shine, okay? If you, I'll bring you ice cream, I promise. Okay? That's how you get the kids to do the singing. Donuts and ice cream. Works every time. Okay. okay. An angel cried out to the Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. All right, Peter.
In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Regina Celi, Letare, Alleluia. Quia quem eruisti portare, Alleluia. Resurrexit, sicut dixit, Alleluia. Ora pro nobis Deum, Alleluia. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, Indeed he is risen. He is risen. risen.